And I, uh, I was actually on the faculty of the Australian National University, as Ben said. And this is the first time I've been on an Australian campus. Actually, that's a lie. Two days ago, I was on the University of Sydney campus. This is the second time I've been on an Australian University campus in all those years, 37 years later. And it's a very interesting day to be here because two big things are about to happen uh, on our topic. The first is that a new government of Israel will be announced very likely this very day. It's only, uh, I don't know, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning in Israel. But sometime tomorrow, Thursday, Israel time, uh, a new Israeli government, and a, and a government very different from the one that it's replacing, is going to take power. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then just a few days later, next Wednesday and Thursday, President Barack Obama will be in Israel for the first time ever as president for rather important talks with the Israeli Prime Minister. That's my main topic of what is going to happen. And I think uh, uh, that uh, based on the information reaching me, that we are headed for very significant changes and developments um, on two issues. One is uh, the relation between Israel and the Palestinians and a resumption of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. And the other is the uh, accelerating uh, uh, crisis uh, of Iran and the Iranian nuclear weapons program. And on both fronts, I predict to you that fairly dramatic changes have come. Um, let me start with the uh, uh, Israeli government that will be announced. Uh, what makes it different is that this government will be uh, similar in the sense that Netanyahu will be the prime minister and the Likud will be the largest party, but it will be different because the partners in this government will be the center-left parties, uh, several center-left parties, three center-left parties. Um, and that is a big change. The government that it replaced was a government of the right and the so-called ultra-orthodox, and was the most conservative government in Israel's history. Uh, representing the most conservative Knesset, that's the legislature, in Israel's history. Even the government of Menachem Begin and Yitzhak Shamir, which you probably studied in history, were not as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, the, the, the membership of the Knesset at the time was not as conservative as we had for the preceding four years. But the, uh, the elections that were held in these places, um, the elections that were held a few weeks ago resulted for the first time in many years in a net shift in the balance of power inside the Knesset from the right somewhat to the left, with the result that, the, that today's Knesset is just about exactly 50-50 left and right. Uh, it's evenly divided. This is a significant change from the Knesset that it replaced. And the new government, as I already said, will be a government of the right, yes, but in partnership with the center-left. And the government guidelines, which will be published in the next 48 hours, and the, and, the, um, and the coalition agreement that produces the government guidelines will include in it some propositions that would have been impossible in the preceding government, one of which is to make a high priority of resumption of peace negotiations with the Palestinians. And in fact, the Prime Minister has already agreed to make uh, a woman named Sippy Livni, who was the leader of the left opposition in the preceding Knesset, the chief negotiator with the Palestinians. And in fact, she led the negotiations with the Palestinians once before in 19, I'm uh, sorry, in 2000, uh, 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 um, it led the negotiations of the Olmert government with the Palestinians. And if you follow these things, you know that those were some of the most advanced Israeli-Palestinian negotiations ever to take place, although they did not result in an agreement. In the end, 
they resulted in uh, a much greater convergence of Israeli and Palestinian positions than any preceding negotiation. So when President Obama lands on Wednesday, he's going to be talking to a different Israel, a different Israeli government. And I want to, I want to make uh, some assertions here that you, some people may find non-credible. Uh, about Netanyahu's motives. Netanyahu is often depicted as a hardline right-wing guy. I spent a lot of time with Netanyahu, although most of it was years ago. And I feel that I know him a little bit. And uh, I want to describe to you his, what I take to be his motivation. And it's a little bit different from the depiction that's usually made. Netanyahu is a man who's devoted his entire career to one central theme. It was the theme that was captured by the title of his book. He wrote a book called Israel Among the Nations. And people don't think enough about the meaning of that title. His, 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 his original uh, emphasis when he first started out in political life was the notion that Israel could be part of the Western world as a bulwark against the former Soviet Union, global communism, the Warsaw Pact, and was a natural ally of the United States and the NATO alliance, he even talked at times about Israel joining NATO. And his whole theme was embedding Israel in the Western family of nations. Later on, he talked about Israel's contribution to the global war on terror, especially after 9-11. And he talked about uh, Israel's struggle with Islamic extremism and with terrorism more generally. And later still, this time I come here and bring a can of oil. There's an old saying, the squeaky door gets oil, but not at Monash. <laughs> um, uh, I keep getting thrown off by that. Uh, he. It, it, it more recently, he developed the theme of Israel's interest in democratization of the Middle East. Instead of being the only democracy in the Middle East, Israel wanted to make a contribution or be part of the effort to, to help bring democracy to uh, the, uh, all the autocracies and tyrannies around it. And he asserted, I'm not sure it's true personally, that democracies don't make war and that it would bring peace to the Middle East. But, but in each of these themes, which have been the main themes of his career, his emphasis was on Israel among the nations. Well, why is that so special? The answer is that he comes from, in, on the right in Israel, the right in Israel was really founded by uh, the founder of, of revisionist Zionism, Zev Jabotinsky. And Jabotinsky's main theme was that the Christian world cannot be trusted. We are alone, we the Jews, we the Israelis, we are alone. We can count only on ourselves. We have to pursue a policy of autarky and self-reliance. We can't trust anybody. The whole world wants to see the Jews dead. And that's why we need an Israel. The hell with what they think of us. Uh, we have to be strong. And that was, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that was kind of the thrust of the revisionist Zionist movement. And most of the <coughs> earlier Likud leaders, like Menachem Begin and Yitzhak Shamir, weren't much interested in embedding Israel in the West or depicting Israel as Israel among the nations. They were interested in making Israel strong in and of itself and not trusting or depending on anyone. So Netanyahu is rather a different kind of leader of the right. But the last four years have not been a happy experience in this regard. The re reality, as everybody knows, is that Israel's relations with most of its principal allies have become frayed and weakened, and even with the United States, but especially in places like Germany, where Chancellor Angela Merkel was a, was a friend of, of Israel, is a friend of Israel, but really developed a deep dislike for this prime minister, Netanyahu. And uh, she has been quite negative about him and the Israeli government and, and issued a lot of warnings. And the same was true of the conservative leader of France, he's no longer the president, Sarkozy. 
um, got tired of it, and, and uh, so uh, Cameron in the United Kingdom was the leader of the Tories there. And um, Israel's relations have been frayed. And so I make the assertion to you, not everybody's going to believe this, that Netanyahu actually prefers being in a government that is anchored in the right, but in alliance with the center left and never actually wanted a government that was as far right as the one that just left power. He got stuck with it, it's a long story and I don't want to take too much time, partly because Livni, who was at the time the head of the center left, uh, Kadima, uh, tried to drive too hard a bargain back in 2009 and, and said that if she was going to join the government, she would have to be the prime minister, or at least by rotation. She demanded it to, it was a bridge too far, and, and it failed. And so he formed the coalition that he formed instead. But I, I assert to you that it was never his preferred coalition. And he's actually happier with what he's about to do. So, but in any case, he will be obligated by a coalition agreement to go on a somewhat different path. Now, what is that different path? In Israel, uh, in Israel, oh yeah, I have to around here. In Israel, um, the thinking about the Palestinian question has, has changed a little bit. In the Oslo years, the attempt was to come uh, to a comprehensive agreement, what was called a, a conflict ending agreement, in which all of the final status issues were, were to be resolved in one grand bargain. But it was a grand bargain that imposed on the two sides maximum burdens. The Palestinians would have to sign, all, sign away the so-called right of return and acknowledge that the, what they consider the Palestinian refugees were never going to return to Israel. They would go to Palestine, they would go to the West Bank and Gaza, which would be the Palestinian state, but they would never return to Israel. In the Palestinian world, that is a very deep issue. And, and what really, and, and probably played a greater role in the refusal of first Yasser Arafat and later Mahmoud Abbas to sign the various agreements that were put in front of them because they didn't want to be the one to sign away the right of return and be accused of treason by the Palestinian hardliners. And in Israel, a final agreement would require a prime minister and, his, and the political party to sign away portions of Jerusalem, uh, divide Jerusalem, would require Israel to surrender the greater part of Judea and Samaria, the land of the Bible, uh, the, uh, the lands of our uh, our forefathers and mothers, uh, a very bitter pill. And um, a final status agreement, while as a magnetic ideal, was also the single hardest thing to do. In Israel, thinking has shifted. There's a lack of trust between Israelis and Palestinians. We're starting from a very bad starting point for this next round of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. And the thinking in Israel is, it would be more practical to have a phased approach with a step one that precedes the step two. The step one would be a Palestinian state with temporary borders and, and, and leaving the most difficult issues for resolution in a second round that would follow at some future date. And that in the first round, the Palestinian uh, 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 state would be created on a temporary basis, a somewhat shrunken basis, uh, but the Palestinians, on the other hand, would not be required to surrender their demand for the right of return. Israel would not be required to do some of the harder things that it will have to someday do in the final agreement. And there'd be a little more limited step. This was actually agreed among the parties in 2003, 10 years ago. People forget that in 2003, we had the so-called quartet, the United States, Russia, the European Union, and the, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, promulgated something called the roadmap. And the roadmap 
uh, the second stage of the roadmap provided for a Palestinian state with temporary borders, precisely what I just described. And most importantly, the roadmap was signed by the then Prime Minister of Israel, Ariel Sharon. It was signed by the then and current President of Palestine, Mahmoud Abbas, who said when he signed it, that he signed it without reservation. Those were his words. And equally important, the roadmap was endorsed by the United Nations Security Council in Resolution 1550 in 2003. <coughs> That's an interesting fact because you may not know this, but the Oslo Accords and the various agreements between the Israelis and Palestinians from the 1990s were never endorsed by the UN Security Council. Uh, and nor was any other Israeli-Palestinian agreement ever endorsed by the only Israeli-Palestinian agreement ever endorsed by the UN Security Council was the roadmap. So <clears throat> it has a certain standing. So the thinking in Israel is let's do let's do what is achievable. Let's not focus on something that might be ideal, a conflict ending final status agreement, but is not attainable. Politics is the art of the possible. Uh, the art of diplomacy is to get from here to there. And let's do this in, in, in a stage-by-stage, -stage, phased approach. I will live and work in Washington, and I have some feel for what the trends are in the Obama administration's uh, negotiating team. And I think there, too, there is a new attitude. You know, this president, Barack Obama, was elected partly in 2009, the first time, on a platform of, of restoring peace between Israelis and Palestinians and solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Matter of fact, when he took office the first time, and he stepped into the White House for the very first time on January 9th, 2009, uh, his first four telephone calls from the Oval Office were to Middle Eastern leaders. On the morning of January 9, 2009, four years ago, he called Mahmoud Abbas, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak, President of Egypt, and King Abdullah of Jordan. Those were the first four telephone calls that Barack Obama ever made as president. And it was meant to be symbolic. It was meant to symbolize the priority that he attached and he publicly stated that I am going, and, and the Democrats had been elected in 2009 claiming, personally I don't think the claim was true, that the, that the uh, Bush administration had neglected diplomacy in the Middle East. They asserted again and again, you can find all kinds of speeches from Obama at that time, saying that Bill Clinton, when he was president, was this close to peace between Israelis and Palestinians. That was the assertion. I'm not sure that's true either. But that was the assertion. And, and we could have finished the job if only George W. Bush didn't drop the ball and have a policy of benign neglect and let the conflict fester. And he had a, a foreign policy that was only the use of force. And he didn't use diplomacy, especially not multilateral diplomacy. And I, your new president, am going to fix all of that. And I am going to go back to this. You now have a president who's ready to roll up his sleeves and work with allies and get the job done. And his self-image was clearly, in 2009, that he was a transformative figure who was not only going to transform America, he was going to transform the world. And, he, and one of the most important aspects of that was going to be bring peace to the Israelis and Palestinians, which he depicted as the centerpiece of all these conflicts in the Middle East. Well, it didn't turn out that way. Here we are four years later, and the result that he got, I don't mean to bash Obama with this, and to, but I think he himself, if he was standing here, would tell you he was quite disappointed with what actually happened. The simple reality is that the last four years are the first time since 1989 that there were no Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Actually, if you study the record, there were almost continuous Israeli-Palestinian negotiations that were more or less progressive from 1989 until 2009, and they came to a screeching halt more or less exactly as Obama became president. 
Now we can have a great debate about whose fault that is, but it is a fact that there have been for four years, most of your, you know, uh, uh, years as young adults, no Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. And, and, and the president gave a series of interviews in which he expressed his disappointment about this fact, and he said that he, that he, with the advantage of hindsight, he wished he hadn't raised expectations quite so high. I think he also, if he was candid, would say, that he, sorry he got in such a fracas with the Prime Minister of Israel, it would have been better to work with Israel in an adversarial manner. But uh, anyway, whatever was the cause, the result was not good. He's landing in Israel on Wednesday, and he's sitting with the new Israeli Prime Minister, a man with the same name, but standing on a different foundation, on the basis of a different uh, a set of policy guidelines. And I can tell you authoritatively that his purpose is to come to a set of understandings with Benio about Israeli-Palestinian negotiations and also about Iran. You know, I, I realize that I've used more time than I had planned on the Palestinians and maybe I better not talk about Iran or should I take another few minutes and talk about take Iran? Take another few minutes and we'll have a shorter question next. Okay, well, actually, you know what? Let's do it the other way. Let's have a discussion of this, and if time permits, we'll talk about Iran instead of the other way. Let me just close out this part about the Palestinians and apologize to you that I've taken longer than I planned, but there's a lot of parts to tell. This is not going to be a walk in the park. I don't mean to suggest to you that everything is going to fall neatly in place. But I do mean to suggest to you that we're headed for a somewhat different period uh, that's going to affect Israel and friends of Israel and Palestinians and a lot of people. And it's going to be a period in which the United States, the Europeans, other allies like Australia, and even the Arab League are going to place a much higher priority on bringing uh, about a resumption of Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations. Let me say a word about the Arab League. In my day, we used to think of the Arab League as a rejectionist organization uh, full of hardliners. But actually, today's Arab League has evolved. I don't say it's a Zionist organization badly in love with Israel, but I do say that it's an organization dominated by less radical voices. As a matter of fact, it used to be that the rejectionist camp, what they called the steadfastness camp, inside the Arab League, was headed by the Syrians. But I hardly have to tell you that Bashar Assad has lost all credibility because he is basically killing Sunnis on behalf of Iran, and the rest of the Arab League is Sunni, and very unhappy about what he's doing. As a matter of fact, many of the members of the Arab League are arming the Syrian opposition against him. So he's in no position to play the role that he played for two decades and his father before him of being the, 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 the one who prevented the Arab League from doing anything in the moderate direction. Basically, the radical wing of the Arab League has been almost extinguished. That doesn't mean everybody else is a dove of peace or some kind of wonderful lover of Israel, but it does mean that you have a different center of gravity in the Arab League today. And I make to you the prediction which may also strain credulity, that the Arab League is going to be on the side of resuming Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. So we have difficulties, but we also have assets to work with in the period that lies ahead. It's going to, that there are a lot of thorny issues, even for a interim agreement. And I don't really want to be remembered as having said that all of this is going to be, as I say, a walk in the park. But I do think that we are going to a different place. So uh, with that, why don't we have uh, a discussion of that? Please. Yeah, I'm just interested in about your predictions for the next government of Israel with respect to the fact that if you look at the makeup of the government, you'll end up with 31 
which would be 10 receipts, add on another 12 for um, 13. Sorry, for, sorry, 13 for 80, 12 for 80 would be. Because you're talking about it then. Yeah. Yes. So that brings it to 43 out of a makeup of 68 seats, I believe, which leaves Yerlapid, uh, Yeshatid with 19, and and uh, Kadima with six. That's four parties making up. And probably ultimately, although not immediately, uh, uh, Kadima itself uh, with two, two seats. Yeah. So in effect, you actually have. Fortunately, potentially a more right-wing government in terms of the actual representation in the concept. So I'm just interested to say it's not more of because it used to be 100 um, percent. But but uh, let me you have a point that the numerical balance is still primarily that there are more of the right. However, point number one, you're lumping the Russians, Israel, Vitano, and Lieberman, with the Likud. If you study the positions uh, of Lieberman, he's not loved in the Western world, but he, in fact, has been an advocate of a two-state solution, unlike most members of the Likud. He has talked about a land swap. He has, he has openly uh, advocated a Palestinian capital in Jerusalem, which is uh, anathema for most members of the Likud and to, and to Bennett's party. So I, I don't think Although his, the two parties merged, he also announced that they might separate all over again after the government is formed. I don't think you should, you should take it as a given that um, the, the numbers that you just laid out. I don't want to bore people who don't, don't follow this. This is a little too detailed here. But, uh, but the more important point is, the more important point is that if the center-left parties leave his government, he doesn't have a government. And he, and he has nobody to replace him. Uh, the very reason he's formed this government is that numerically no other government works. And if, if it were to come about that the, um, the government did not live up to its commitment to uh, a resumption of negotiations with the Palestinians, it's very possible that, for example, Libni would leave the government or uh, Lapid would leave the government. And if they did, the government would collapse. Uh, because there would no longer be more than 60 in 120, or 61 and 120. <coughs> so uh, the way Israeli politics works, that is the leverage. Well, I mean, by the same token, though, in Israel, you know, if you look at you know, number, t number two on their list and potential future leader of the party, Yair Shamir, he's openly opposed to the idea of a Palestinian state. Yeah, it is true the that if there ever were... The yeah, Minister for Water and Electricity, Uzi Landau, is openly against the idea of the Palestinian state, and they're quite influential figures inside the party. So, I, I mean, by the same token, if, if Netanyahu were to start engaging in serious peace talks, you potentially lose, you know, that end of Israel Israel as well. So, I'm so interested. A, a, an agreement with the Palestinians, if you really imagine the day where one was signed, would almost surely lead to the collapse of the government anyway, <laughs> partly for the reasons that you laid out. But, but, wait, there's more. The uh, Israeli law requires a referendum on any agreement that would involve change in Israel's borders, if you're aware of that. And in several past rounds of negotiation, the, the position of the Israeli prime ministers, several different ones, has been that the referendum would take the form of a new election, with the agreement left, but this is, this is fact, and, and that the agreement would be put to the people of Israel in the form of, if you are in favor of this agreement, a vote for the, the party led by the one who signed the agreement, which might not be today's Likud, and uh, if you're against it, vote against it. And um, if it were in fact true that Netanyahu was in favor, had a, a, a came to an agreement with the Palestinians and considered a priority, don't take for granted that he would run the next election as the head of the Likud. He might run in a hybrid party, as Ariel Sharon did, you remember where Kadima came from. It came from exactly this, that Sharon was being held back by the Likud. He was the one who invented the Likud, created the Likud, not to mention was the father of the settlements. And when he decided to do what he called disengagement from Gaza, to leave Gaza, he knew that his own party would oppose it, so he left his own party. 
and they joined Shimon Peres, who was the leader of the left, and they formed this very bizarre hybrid called Kadima, exactly for the purpose of proceeding, and they won the election. So I, I hold that up to you as a precedent. If, if I am right that this is where things are headed, that is probably the path that it will take. You are correct that the government will collapse. A government, a government that either signed an agreement or refused to sign an agreement, either way it will collapse. Uh, and, and, and it will have to be reconstituted through new elections because no other government is possible on the foundation of today's Knesset. Anybody else? Please. Um, there's a, been a lot of talk about Netanyahu and the Jewish
was a compromise that was supposed to, on the one hand, permit natural growth for these communities, many of whom were having children and had suffered from conditions of crowding, and on the other hand, to put an end to the geographic expansion of the territorial footprint of the settlement communities. So uh, it was something that Shimon Perez at the time dubbed vertical growth rather than horizontal growth. And the United States accepted this. Uh, a second principle was that Jewish communities in Jerusalem, in the eastern sector of Jerusalem, what, what some people call across the green line, uh, would be would treated in a different category. That that was part of sovereign Israel, and there would be uh, no restrictions on growth. The Bush administration accepted this. And the third principle was that on the Israeli side, they would not permit further expansion of the uh, settlements in the interior of the West Bank, the so-called non-consensus settlements. I know this is a little complicated, but that, those was a set of American-Israeli understandings. <coughs> that Sharon actually um, negotiated, and Nate Yellow expressed a willingness to go back to it. In 2009, uh, Obama rejected those in 2009. I think the Americans are taking a second look at those principles, and they may be willing to use them as a foundation. If we were to imagine uh, Nate Yellow trying to go back to those principles today, you are right that he would have a clash inside his government, a deep split where the parties in the center-left would agree to them. Uh, my prediction is that Israel Bekeno would agree to them, although that's not for sure. Uh, but the um, uh, Bennett would not agree to them. The question is, would he leave the government over this? Um, and that's an unknown. Just to add on to that, see. I can use my cap to ask the question now. Uh, what are the do you think of, uh, President Obama will seriously consider going back to that agreement between Sharon and, and Bush South settlement? Because it does. I don't think he'll agree things. to it in the form you expressed it, right. but I think he may well agree to it expressed a different way. Right. Same same concepts repackaged, old wine and a new bottle. Right. Uh, it'd be humiliating for them to do a 180 and say we were wrong and we're going to have a different. But watch this space. Um, you work for APAC. Um, could you actually talk about um, the relationship between APAC and the, the more liberal uh, J Street um, lobby group? The relationship well, between the, the government and the, Jewish, the American Jews to those two organizations? They don't have much of a relationship. I don't, I don't know if you mean a relationship. I, I think you really mean, can I compare them? Well, I'll give you a comparison. Just this week, J Street took a congressional delegation to Israel, but it was a delegation of four members of the far left of the Democratic Party. APAC had took in the last 12 months uh, 95 members of the Congress to Israel and, a, and another bunch from the Senate. It, it, it's, you're talking about a comparison of a giant and a, 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 a mosquito. Uh, I don't mean to say that you're obligated to consider APAC better for that reason. But everybody who follows this would know that it's way bigger. The media has built up the J Street because many of the reporters themselves share J Street's perspective. Maybe they're right or maybe they're wrong, but it's their view. And so they've made it into, given it the appearance of being far bigger than it is, the APAC budget is $95 million. The J Street budget is $5 million. So <clears throat> you're really talking about two things of grossly unequal magnitude. Uh, President Obama has spoken at the APEC annual meeting or policy conference four of the last six years, and this year he sent Vice President Biden. And there's never been a senior American official at a J Street meeting. So I think it's been built up into something way beyond reality. Now, if you want to get into an ideological discussion, whether it's closer to your views or somebody else, it's a different subject. But if you want to talk about it as just Political science, who's powerful and who's not, is, is no comparison. Please. Please. Um, the Palestinian Authority has, all, whenever it comes to negotiations, the Israeli government will always insist on keeping Ariel, and the Palestinian Authority will always say, well, you can't keep the settlement of Ariel. 
Um, will that? It's an educated group. I'm a little scared of these questions because I, I worry that as you and I get more deeply into Ariel, yeah. that I, I, maybe I'm wrong, I'm meeting you folks for the first time, but I'm guessing that the majority of people in the room don't exactly know what Ariel is. How many people know what Ariel is? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do this a different way. Uh, about the about most controversial. Israel, for example. Can you say again? About about being to Israel for an extended period of time. Oh, I'm sorry, I underestimated. I, as you can see. All right, let's talk about Ariel. Yeah. The most controversial of the so-called settlement blocks is Ariel. And there is a deep split on the subject of Ariel among Israelis of the so-called peace camp. Some consider that no agreement is going to be possible without protecting Jewish presence in Ariel. Others consider that it's going to be impossible for any Palestinian leader to sign it. I think that's the reason you yeah. brought up it. By the way, you might have brought up E1 also, which is yeah. another one. Um, I can't tell you what the outcome is going to be on Ariel, but it's going to be in the category of almost impossible to solve problems in the first phase. I can promise you this. An interim Palestinian state with temporary borders will not include Israel leaving Ariel. Whether a final status agreement someday is another subject. But one of the several reasons not to have a final status negotiation right now that tries to resolve the entire conflict is Arab. One last question. Well, Stephen, did you have one? No? I'll ask the broad question. What would you say to people who say on the far right and on the far left who say that a one state solution is the alternative? What would you say to them? Good luck. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, you live on campus. I live in the world of politics. It's the art of possible. There's not going to be a one-state solution. It's just one of those hypotheticals, you know, like, what if, what if God was one of us? Or uh, what if we lived forever? Or, you know, I, I, I don't have the capacity. I have enough trouble with the stuff here on Earth. There's not going to be a one-state solution, I promise you. Anyway, thank you so much for your hospitality, and I apologize for the Thank you. Thank you. Very, very much for being here. I am Ricky of Monash. I have a little present for you. It's a CD. What is it? It's a chocolate. It's a chocolate. It's a chocolate. Well, unfortunately, I do. <laughs> So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And I apologize for mentioning on Ariel, and I guess the art exchange about the party structure of the government, I was a little nervous, because you obviously have a deep knowledge of the parties. And I thought you and I were the only ones in the room who did, but I guess, how many people here know what uh, Bennett's political party is? Impressive. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Uh, uh, just, uh, just one quick announcement. We have Professor Alan Johnson at the AJAC offices on Sunday.